From the Toronto Star, I'm Reggie Mudler, and this matters. Toronto's white hot real estate market is in free fall. The pandemic has various different forecasts calling for potential price gains or double digit drops. A recent Bloomberg study said that while consumer confidence in some retail and business sectors is starting to go up, housing is an area that Canadians are pessimistic about as they believe prices will go down. Of course, it's that type of thinking that is starting to fuel talk of an opportunity. Vice wrote an article recently called, Sadly, the pandemic could be millennials' best chance to buy a house. And the Star's real estate reporter, Tess Kalinowski, wrote a piece with the headline, Home sales are down 69%. Is this a once in a decade chance to get into Toronto's housing market? So, it's all a bit confusing, particularly if you're a young person trying to navigate the market for the first time. We decided to get an expert to talk about the current state of the real estate market. So today, we are joined by Phil Soper, CEO, Royal LePage and Bridgemark Real Estate Services. Mr. Soper, thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. So real estate is a topic that everyone is interested in right now. There's a lot of change going on. I want to talk about that specifically, but from your perspective and at this moment that we're talking right now, what are you seeing and what is going on in the market right now, broadly speaking? Where we are right now, which is halfway through spring 2020, we're in a recovery phase. The Canadian housing industry shut down like much of the economy, in response to our governments, our leaders, uh, our public health authorities asking us to shelter at home. Real estate was declared an essential service because of people's need for housing right across the country, with the exception for a few weeks in Quebec. Actually, more business was conducted during the heart of the pandemic than we expected. We thought Emergency transactions would amount to 10, 15% of normal, and it worked out to between, say, a third to a half of normal during the deepest parts of the shutdown. But activity levels and interest levels have been rising since the bottom of the curve. I find those numbers really interesting, but I think the thing that I really want to ask you about right now is there's a mantra we're hearing that right now might be a, and I use air quotes here, once in a lifetime opportunity to buy. Is that true? And do you agree? In every major economic downturn, there are people who are less risk averse, who trade in the market. And not just the real estate market, but other forms of trading like buying and selling of stocks. When you're in a situation where volumes are much lower than normal. The previous example that most closely represents this, although that was an economically driven problem, was the Great Recession of 2008 and In the recovery phase, there are some people who benefit from being early in the market and demanding what I've been calling a risk premium. So if you were a buyer in April or early May in Canada and you were in market, you knew that we were operating under strict shelter-at-home provisions and that most people in the country, the last thing they were thinking about was buying and selling real estate. So if you were in market, you would say, listen, I'm taking a risk here, be it a health risk or a financial risk, and I expect to be compensated somewhat in terms of a deal. If you're a seller in those times, you might fall into two categories. One that wanted to be a buyer. In other words, most people that sell real estate turn around and buy because they need to put a roof over their head. So you wanted to take advantage of, say, the opportunity to move up. Or you might have been someone who's motivated by some kind of urgency that you've already purchased a home, which is very common in our busy market, and you needed to sell in order to pay for your new home that would be uh, closing soon. So you were willing to provide a deal. And so you had transactions occur and prices drop. It's not a true reflection of the value of real estate because the transaction volumes are so low that in a way it's almost meaningless, but it does present an opportunity for those who are in the market. What about millennials, sir? I mean, this is one of these things that, I mean, I read an article saying this could be your time. And I believe that you've also made some comments about how 
in this recovery, first time home buyers are going to play an oversized role. I'm curious about why you think that. And then is there any advice to how they may be able to take this opportunity? So millennials are the largest population cohort in Canadian and back North American history. There are more millennials than there are baby boomers. So it's a big, powerful economic force. The oldest millennials are mid-30s. Depending on where you draw your lines, the oldest millennials could be 36, 37, so not kids. And many of those people have started families and are, if they're not already in the market, we think about 40% of millennials are homeowners right now compared to about 70% of Canadians overall. But let's focus specifically on the younger millennials who represent our first-time home buyers. Based on history and the unique circumstances of the COVID-19 driven economic crisis, we know first time home buyers can play an important role in economic recovery and the recovery of housing markets. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, they don't have the baggage of an existing home to sell. Even though logically, In an economic crisis where, say, home prices are depressed, if you are looking to buy another home, even if you sell your home at a discount to the value you think it should be worth or it was worth the previous year, logically, you know you'll be able to buy one at a discount. If you're moving up in homes, there's an economic advantage there. But emotionally, it's really tough for people to sell when their value is falling. Well, guess what? First-time home buyers, millennials, don't have that baggage. They have no house to worry about selling. And that's exactly what happened in the recovery phase of the Great Recession in 08 and 09. In about May of 2009, and a little bit of a pat on the back for us, we had predicted it in uh, January of 2009. We said we believed that first-time home buyers would create the first wave of buying activity that would lead Canada out of the Great Recession and revive the housing market. And that's exactly what happened. And it was in about May of 2009 that that happened. Well, there's another element here, a subtle element that is also happening during the COVID-19 recovery. And that has to do with the skewed severity of this particular medical crisis as you get older. First-time homebuyers tend to be young. They tend to be less severely impacted by the disease. If they do contact it, they tend to go through the disease without the high risk of a fatality, and their symptoms tend to be managed better. And as you skew older, it becomes more challenging. So they have an advantage both in terms of their health through their youth and the fact that they don't have a property to sell. So if they are among those who have full-time employment, if they feel financially secure, they have the advantage of historically low interest rates, less competition in market, no home to sell, and a feeling of relative strength related to battling the disease. All those things add up to a relatively unique opportunity for millennials to enter the housing market. There are a lot of conflicting reports and forecasts out there about whether prices are going to go up or down, with some saying they could fall by 18%. What numbers should we be paying attention to? Using Toronto as an example, during the last month that we have reported results, which is April, home prices overall fell by 9%, not quite 10 But you have to look at how average home prices are calculated to understand what that really means. What we do is we take the total value of all real estate sold divided by the number of homes sold. And what happens in a slowdown like this, and this one has been exaggerated, is you tend to have more of a fall off at the high end, call it luxury, very expensive homes, than you do at moderately priced home. And the reason I say it's been exaggerated in this case is because the age of ownership of luxury homes tends to skew older. You tend to have older homeowners in more expensive housing because people tend to move up in the quality or the value of the real estate they own through their lifetime. And of course, as we just spoke about, as you get older, the impact of COVID-19 becomes more severe. So we've had a fall off, a disproportionately high fall off 
in the number of expensive homes sold in our big cities. And Toronto, it really, it's really obvious in Toronto in the 3 million plus home category. So it's skewing, it's making the calculation look like home values fell by that 9%. We believe when you adjust for the mix, if you were to look at the same category of home, say condominium or entry level detached home, the values have probably fallen by about 5% compared to early March or February of 2020 before the, the lockdown. So a material change, but not as dramatic as the headline information. And one last point on valuations. We began the year with a fairly severe housing shortage. Demand was very high. We had a record first quarter in real estate in Canada. All markets for the first time since early part of the last decade were pulling ahead. Even Calgary, which has suffered in the oil industry, was pulling ahead. Toronto is way ahead. I believe we would have been at around a plus 15 year over year home price average in Toronto right now if it hadn't been for COVID-19. So when you look at that plus 15 number that would have been and the minus five number that is, you see a dramatic change in the value or the accessibility of real estate, particularly for young people, of 20%. That's a huge change when you think of half a million dollar entry-level homes. You're talking about $100,000 in relative change in valuation. So it's not surprising that we anticipate there'll be more demand by first-time home buyers for housing in Toronto and across the country. You mentioned condos. There's a lot of talk about an officeless future that potentially could be, I mean, obviously that's further down the line, but there's been talk about condo bubbles and pricing forever. What are you thinking about them and that market in particular? Longer term, I don't see a change in mix in terms of condominiums versus detached. We did see well before the pandemic, a trend towards what we, we coined the term exurb. So you've got urban living, suburban living, and then we used, again, to use the Ontario example, if you look at cities like Cambridge Waterloo or London, Ontario, or to the east, Kingston or Belleville, cities that are outside of commuting range for least sane commuters, but still accessible for big city uh, amenities like going to a game or a concert or something. And we saw a material move of retiring baby boomers there's about 5,000 baby boomers retiring a week in Canada now. And those older millennials we talked about earlier who are having their second child, who are in jobs, and isn't this a little bit of a back to the future, having jobs where they could work remotely using networks and technology. We saw a bit of a migration away from the downtown cores to these secondary cities and to the suburbs as well. So that was already underway, but we still had a housing shortage in our big city cores because of the great wave of this huge population of millennials, plus immigration and plus interprovincial migration, people moving from other parts of Canada into, say, southern BC or southern Ontario for economic opportunity. So we didn't have enough condos and homes to support the demand and prices were rising, even as retiring boomers and older millennials were looking at these secondary cities and prices there were rising at a greater rate than the city. So overall, it comes back to that housing shortage challenge we had. So now we're into the pandemic and we're looking at condominiums and we're saying, gosh, you know, that might be a challenge for the future. Do people want to live in condominiums, et cetera? Well, the first thing is the risk in condominium livings isn't necessarily any higher than other kinds of living. If you look at some of the best examples of managing through the health crisis in the world, they're in cities that are dramatically more dense than our most dense city, which is Vancouver. It's quite a bit denser than Toronto. Places like Singapore, Seoul, Korea, Hong Kong have done very, very well, way better than Europe and North America in managing the crisis. 
and they're very dense condominium-based cities. So from a health perspective, I believe it'll be like post 9-11. If we go back 20 years, when there was some concern that people wouldn't fly again or that people wouldn't want to live in high towers or work in them, economics drives people back to that kind of living. It is the most efficient way to use real estate and therefore the most affordable real estate and people want to live in those places. Now, in the short term, there will be some softness. Immigration has ground to a halt. New Canadians tend to move into condominiums when they uh, land in the country. There is a significant portion of our condominium stock devoted to uh, their needs. We have a slowing of interprovincial migration. Again, a slowing of that need. We have kids who are learning from university at home. I've got a couple of those that won't need student accommodation in condominiums. And of course, we have the travel and tourism or the short-term rental, the Airbnb effect that the demand there is off. So for some investor owners that maybe are more leveraged than they like to be, their debt levels are too high, they will be selling their condominiums and there should be some softness in select markets that are focused on rental buyers or short term. And that's probably where we're going to see the best opportunities in terms of deals in the real estate market over the coming weeks. You use the term recovery. Is it fair to call this a correction? Yeah, correction is not the right word. It's a word that we, we use to describe overshooting in prices. When prices rise at faster than uh, wages and salaries for an extended period of time, the market corrects. It prices fall, soften until wages and salaries can catch up. Obviously, this is not a correction. This is a reaction to a unprecedented medical uh, crisis. So it's simply, I, I, recession is the right word. The, mar- the economy is shrinking, hopefully for a short, if violent time, and that's caused less demand for many, many sectors of the economy. Is now a good time to buy a cottage? And more importantly, is there any way that you can convince my wife that it's a good idea? (laughs) Well, you know what? There tends to be a softening of demand for recreational property, be it winter or summer and anywhere in the country during economic crises. They tend to be second homes and they tend to be nice to have as opposed to must have. Some people live in cottage country as their primary residence, but the majority, it's a second home. And in times of economic crisis, we delay many luxury purchases. So there should be a softening in prices, which, by the way, were escalating rather rapidly in 2019 and 20 in cottage country, in Ontario specifically, but in other areas of the country as well. Except this one's a little different because people see the appeal of getting out of the city to the lake or to the mountains if you're in another part of the country, because they're not jumping on an airplane and going away on vacation. So they're saying, gosh, you know, I, we've been sort of toying with the idea of a cottage property. Maybe now is the time. So we're not seeing prices drop to the extent they normally would in an economic recession, but they're definitely softer. So if you're looking for an opportunity I wouldn't rush in. I mean, this is give you a little bit of advice on recreational property ownership. It's a little bit like being the entire city infrastructure department. You're the chief engineer for water, sewer, for infrastructure, for roads and highways. You've got to take a broader view of ownership than you typically do for an urban property, and you need to do your research. You've got to think about four seasons. In this case, You really want to find a specialist realtor that deals in that area full time and can tell you what ownership is really like and the kinds of things you should be aware of and where your due diligence should be focused. So don't rush in would be the only advice I'd give you, but it's a pretty good time from an economic standpoint. Well, Phil, that doesn't sound like that would convince my wife very well, but either way, (laughs) I think that was really great for us. And I really, really want to thank you for your time today, sir. Well, my pleasure. And anytime, happy to share thoughts on where the real estate market is going. And you stay safe. Thank you, sir. 
That was Phil Soper, CEO of Royal LePage and Bridgemark Real Estate Services. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Roger Mudler, Adrian Chung, and Saba Etisaz. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden, and our director of programming is J.P. Foso. Our show theme music is by So Called, and our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. Thank you.